Now, what's that saying? It's like men are from Mars and women are from Venus. I think like we've heard that, right? But at Women in Tech, we don't really like following the status quo. We don't really like to follow these stereotypes. So how about up next, I introduce a woman who is designing helicopters that will fly on Mars. She has flown over from California just to be with us today. So I want to introduce the aerospace engineer, Torve Orgren. I had a group of fifth graders come into my office the other day, and we were having this Q&A session. And this kind of shy girl in the back of the room, she slowly raised her hand, and she asked me, what is the coolest thing you've done as an aerospace engineer at NASA? And I got to answer that, you know, around Christmas, I got to fly a helicopter on Mars. But <laughs> <laughs> it was cool, it was cool. And I will for sure tell you more about that. But I also do want to sort of um, take a step back and address the theme of this session, which is indeed a new age of learning. And I want to emphasize that space exploration, which is what I'm very passionate about, is not only about reaching planets, it's also about reaching new heights of understanding and technological innovation. Since I started my first full-time job, um, I've been contributing to a transformative innovation that is really changing the way that we are learning about our solar system. And I'm very stoked about telling you about that today. How about answering finally the question, was there ever life on Mars? So this red, dusty planet, actually, even if you don't think that shares a lot of characteristics with Earth that makes it such an interesting um, extraterrestrial research lab, if you will. It has an atmosphere, it shows signs of having had water, and we have begun to explore this planet with satellites, but we end up with these pretty low um, resolution images. And we sent rovers, which is a fancy way of saying autonomous small cars, um, but they're quite limited, and they're painfully slow, and they're limited to these very smooth surfaces. So we're facing this gap between ground and orbit, and, you know, we do like to fill the gaps, especially as engineers. So how do we do it? We fly, of course. So by unlocking this third dimension, we can start to explore Mars' surface at speeds that is just vastly superior to uh, ground vehicles, but we could also do atmospheric science, and we could investigate hard-to-reach areas like underground caves that are on Mars. And, yep, yeah, this sounds pretty cool in theory, but it has a ring of sci-fi to it. But what if I told you that this picture is indeed from Mars, but it was taken 60 meters up in the air? So three years ago, NASA rover Perseverance landed on Mars with a helicopter attached to its belly. And it was called Ingenuity. And Ingenuity was in indeed assigned to answer the question, can we fly on Mars? And we could. Actually, it went way beyond any expectation that we ever had. It was set out to do five flights, but it completed 72 flights over the course of three years and it was actually just recently taken out of operations. Now, don't get me wrong. If it's one thing that I've learned for one and a half year in the office is that flying to Mars is actually really hard. And Stephanie asked me, or she challenged me to get technical, and I think she's, she might be about to change her mind. Um, <laughs> but one of the obvious challenges is that the Mars atmosphere is just 1% of the one on Earth. So what this means is that we have to design a very lightweight helicopter and it has to spin its rotor super fast. 
obviously also, you know, Mars is kind of far away, so there's a time delay in communication that requires it to be completely autonomous. Now, the question I get asked the most is that how do you actually know how, that this vehicle would behave as you thought it would? Because per definition, you've never done it before. Well, actually, um, this is what I think about most of my awakened time as a flight dynamicist of Mars rovercraft. So how do we get it right? So first of all, we can't really be slop sloppy about our uh, physics-based models. But when you're working on these $100 missions, it's not really enough to just have a helicopter fly on paper or a computer. Um, we do also want to see it take off the ground. And yes, this is an actual video from Mars. But I think you can maybe start to see the caveat here. We're trying to r replicate something on Mars, but we are, you know, on Earth. So, and what you're seeing here is an actual picture from the last flight testing campaign. It was done at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory Space Simulator, which is just a fancy way of saying a huge ass vacuum chamber that we just pump down to the correct density. Um, and then we actually tether it from the ground or from the, from the top with like a motorized line that makes it replicate the Mars um, gravity, which is a third of the one on Earth. Now, you can start to appreciate that this does not really give the full story. It makes it easier to sleep at night, but it still remains uh, some uncertainties in our system. We have to kind of accept that. Well, my team didn't really accept that. So this image here is actually, it has a very, very special place um, in my heart because it's from a flight testing campaign on Mars that I got to lead and design. And what is really, really cool, I think is really cool, is that for the first time in history, we used another planet as a testing facility. And please bear with me, but the idea was that we wanted to excite as much motion in this vehicle to get this very rich data that we were never able to get here on Earth. And yes, it is the most, the riskiest flight that has ever been flown on Mars. And yes, it was nerve wracking because I did not want on my resume uh, to be the first engineer to ever crash a helicopter on Mars, <laughs> especially not the first year on the job. But I do still have a job and it actually was very successful. Um, not only did we you know, gain this final piece of the puzzle that is the flight dynamics of ingenuity. I thought that was very exciting. But we also set this precedent um, about establishing this um, on-planet testing capability. So now moving further or moving beyond, we can start to move all of these expensive and time-consuming testing on Earth, and we just do it straight at the target planet instead. Speaking of the future, I want to give you a little bit of a sneak peek into what my and my team are working on for the next generation of Mars helicopters. So we obviously want to go further and faster, but most of all, we also want to do more meaningful science. So imagine this high-speed, long-range um, scientist that is completely autonomous, and it also has a, a laboratory that can go kilometers at a time. Now, there's also this idea of manned helicopters, and, you know, maybe one day you will be able to get a ticket to Mars and ride on my helicopters, and I will have you sign a waiver. <laughs> now, I can keep talking about these helicopters for, forever, but I will spare you for now, but, you know, we can talk after. Um, but I want to uh, circle back to the classroom with these fifth graders. So this girl, she felt silent for, uh, for a minute. And then she asked me, can I also be a NASA engineer? And I said, yeah, of course. And she said, no, but now. <laughs> and I said, well, 
we should probably ask your parents first. Um, but you know, if it's something that you're passionate about and that you're dreaming, um, and you're you're dreaming about, and that you're willing to work hard for, send your application my way, and, and we'll see what we can do. Um, I'm still waiting for that application, actually. Um, no, but that question actually really resonated with me because I had asked myself that question just two years ago, um, and I, you know for once, actually practiced what I preached, and I got over myself, and I didn't ask my parents, sorry mom, but I did apply, and who knew that just two days after I graduated from, um, from my university, I was on a plane over the Atlantic, and I was pursuing my dream, or my long-standing dream um, in space exploration, and I feel very, very, very fortunate about that. Thank you so much, Tove. I really think that you, you know, at the beginning of the day, we said we wanted to make sure we had some role models and some inspiration, and I, and also not too technical at all. I, everyone was okay, fascinated. Want we want more. Yeah, more. <laughs> okay. We're in Wait, the mingle. I have some equations you... in the backup slides. Perfect. <laughs> Earlier, uh, yesterday at the dinner, we actually said, uh, I mentioned the word engineering or maths, and Tove's eyes perked up and she went, engineering? I want to hear. <laughs> so thank you so much, and, and you have uh, the QR code for people to keep talking but I also know you're going to be here for the mingle as well. So let's give a big round of applause to Torve.